and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Well, today on the show, we're going to talk about one of the worst newer insect problems around the country, especially in the Midwest. It's Japanese beetles. Well, one other thing that's popping up in areas we haven't seen it before is rust. Now, it could be in a variety of different crops. We're going to talk about some of the common rust species on today's show. Well, we've got one of the worst weed problems coming up later in the show for our Weed of the Week. We see it all across the country. We've also got an iron talk later in the show as well. But first, here's today's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. If you're a non-farmer, we just want you to understand that farmers are doing everything they can to provide safe food for our country and really for our planet. But in addition to that, one of the most important things that farmers are doing today is everything they can to manage nutrients so water pollution is not an issue. We want and need clean water in our country. We want to talk today about what farmers are doing to keep that water clean. There are two key nutrients that are really of most interest here when we're talking about water quality. We're talking about nitrogen and we're talking about phosphorus. Now that may seem like one issue to most non-farmers. To farmers, they're two completely different things and we'll explain why. All right, first of all, when it comes to nitrogen, there are a couple different forms in the soil. There's ammonium nitrogen that does not leach, and there's nitrate nitrogen that does leach. And by leach, what I mean is it moves through the soil profile with rain. Well, with nitrate, since it can leach in lighter soils, what can happen is that nitrate can move all the way down and end up in the water. That's obviously not a real great thing. Now, when I say that, please understand all water has some level of nitrate in it. The drinking water quality standard in the United States is 10 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen. So in other words, the government has deemed it safe when you're at 10 parts per million or less. And when you look back at the scientific data that led to the government deciding on that number, you'll find that the number is actually quite a bit higher. The only reason the number is that low is just to be on the safe side. And also they obviously do get concerned about babies. As adults, we could withstand lots of nitrate, not a real big concern for us, but nevertheless, we want to make sure that the water is always at 10 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen or less. So farmers look at their soil test values to determine how much nitrogen their soil can hold and when they should be applying that nitrogen. They also look at the crop growth stages to see the uptake of the crop so they can time those nitrogen applications to parts of the year where that crop is going to be growing rapidly and using up lots of nitrogen quickly. Very specifically, and you can do this even for your lawn, take a soil test, look at cation exchange capacity, multiply that number times 10. That'll tell you roughly how much nitrogen your soil can hold at any one time. That's a really good thing. In addition, you want to look at soil organic matter. If you have a higher level of organic matter, your soil can actually hold some negatively charged things, which it normally can't do but it can hold negatively charged things like nitrate, at least to some degree. So cation exchange capacity, organic matter in the soil, those are two keys to nitrogen holding. Well, speaking of nutrients holding to the soil, phosphorus is an example of a nutrient that generally binds pretty tightly to the soil. So if we can keep the soil in our fields, typically we can keep the phosphorus in our fields too. So if we've got phosphorus getting into water, oftentimes it comes from soil erosion. Phosphorus is actually the number one water quality issue in fresh water today. A lot of the phosphorus that does end up in water, unfortunately, comes from cities, whether that's water treatment plants, sewage treatment plants, just people who are applying way too much phosphorus, way more than what goes into the soil. Those are all certainly considerations. On the farm, what we have to try to do is two things. Number one, reduce or even completely prevent soil erosion and soil getting into water. And number two, place phosphorus just a little bit deeper in the soil. Again, because phosphorus doesn't really leach, we don't have to worry about phosphorus going down. I mean, sure, if you way unbelievably overdo it in sand, then it could possibly leach. But in normal soil and under normal conditions, there's no possible chance phosphorus is ending up down in the groundwater. But where it can be a problem, again, is that soil erosion. 
One other thing that I wanted to mention here, when we talk about nitrate movement in the soil, a lot of non-farmers read things in magazines and newspapers, that type of thing, saying, well, tile is bad, tile is causing this problem. No way. What studies have found is that actually there's less nitrogen moving off a field when there's tile there. And the reason why is because when rain falls, it can soak in the ground when there's tile there, when there's a reservoir for water to go down. So there's less total nitrogen leaving the field. Sure, nitrate can go out through the tile line, but most of the time what we find is the nitrate levels are very low, certainly within that drinking water standard of 10 parts per million. So my point is, Yes, nitrogen can be a problem coming out tile lines, and farmers really have to manage nitrogen a little bit better over tile lines, but for the most part, that is not the big problem in our country. Oh, one other thing too, Brian. Boy, we're gonna talk about this quite a while here because it is such an important topic. The hypoxia zone in the Gulf of Mexico. This is one of the areas that draws a lot of attention and farmers often get blamed for, oh, it must be nutrients coming off fields that are causing this. Well, look, anytime fresh water is gonna meet salt water, there's going to be a zone of hypoxia. That's the way it is. So a few years ago, I went to a conference down at Iowa State University in Ames. And I heard, I listened to a speaker talk about this for an hour and the zone of hypoxia and what farmers need to do, what cities need to do, what everybody needs to do to reduce that zone of hypoxia, which is all great, but my question didn't get answered. So afterwards, I went up and asked my question. I said, it looks like you have records going a long ways back about the size of this zone of hypoxia, right? And they said, yep, we do. Back roughly about 100 years. And I said, okay, well, let's say about 100 years ago, how big was the zone of hypoxia? They said, well, it's actually about the same size as it is today. I said, well, what are we even talking about this for? Before, 100 years ago, we didn't have tile, we didn't have nitrogen getting applied to fields, all this other stuff, yet the zone of hypoxia really hasn't changed. So my point is, it's the mainstream media that's driving a lot of this thing, saying, oh, farmers are doing this bad job in the zone of hypoxia and everything else. It's always been there. Get over it. We're going to have a zone of hypoxia whenever fresh water is going to meet salt water. So, Sure, we as farmers need to do everything we can to manage the nutrients in our fields, but understand that even if we did everything perfectly, there's still going to be that zone of hypoxia down in the Gulf of Mexico. When it comes to protecting water quality, it's a very, very important thing for farmers. Farmers are most concerned about nitrogen and phosphorus, keeping them in their fields. They'll do that by understanding their soil properties, timing out those applications to match up with crop nutrient uptake, and then protecting from soil erosion as well. Water quality is very important to farmers, so is weed control. We'll show you how to stop this weed later in the show. This agro liquid line is something special. A lot of really impressive playmakers. Take a look at Sure K. This guy is an enigma. But wrap your head around the exceptionally high plant response when compared to conventional potassium sources. The research proven plant availability, plus flexible application options and mixing capabilities. Really stellar performance stats. Sure K is a true standout, and that's a winning goal on any field. Commodity Classic is a great place to recharge your batteries, to reconnect with why you started farming in the first place, and why you can't imagine doing anything else. You'll be among thousands of farmers who share your thirst for knowledge and your passion for agriculture. Commodity Classic is a positive, uplifting, and inspiring environment, one that will get you fired up to grow beyond when you head back home. Spend some serious farmer time in Anaheim, Tuesday, February 27th through Thursday, March 1st. Discover more at commodityclassic.com. Increase your productivity with Hypro's dual React control system. The dual nozzle body design allows you to drive at the speed you want while maintaining the rate and droplet size you need. Hypro, helping you spray better. Smart farming is playing hockey with my son. Alright, sweetie, are you excited to go? Yeah. <laughs> Smart farming? is going on more family vacations. Smart farming is getting some much needed rest. Smart farming is spending more time doing what you love. Make it happen with Farm Command. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today.
out. In life, when you put the max in, you get the max out. It's no different for your corn, which is why 40 years of effort have gone into proving that Instinct and Anserve nitrogen stabilizers do more than just stabilize nitrogen. They maximize nitrogen. So your corn gives you the max in return. There are many different rust species, including common rust, stripe rust, southern rust, and these can affect a number of different crops. We're going to talk today about what these rusts are, how they get into your fields, and what you can do to stop them. Well, being in the northern part of the Corn Belt, we occasionally see some rust, but it's normally not this big issue for us, although it is a growing issue in our area. One of the things that's protected farmers in the northern part of the U.S. is the rusts have not overwintered, and they've got to blow up from the south each season. So rust spores that will start in Texas and some of the southern states will move north through our country during the season with wind and with storms. Well, the rust that Darren and I are most familiar with is common rust. We've seen it on different crops for many, many years in the northern Corn Belt. Fortunately, most of the time, it really hasn't been an enormous yield robber. Comes pretty late in the season, like Darren said, blows up from the south. We see a little bit, and even the guys that treat, yep, they have less, I mean, treat with fungicide, they have less common rust, but they don't gain a tremendous amount of yield. Now, that's been over the last, say, 20 years. Here's the thing today. Our yields are much higher, our yield goals are higher yet. We want more yield, and now fungicides are at an all-time low price. So we need to kind of relook at this thing a little bit. It's possible even with common rust, you may be able to justify a treatment depending on your crop. All right, here's one though that will definitely pay, Brian, southern rust in corn. This one's been a huge yield robber uh, on the East Coast and in southern states, and it's moving further north. This year it got up into Nebraska in time to damage some yields. Southern rust is a real aggressive rust species that strikes cornfields, and you say, okay, well, it's rust, we just need to spray fungicide. Good luck. You're going to need to spray again and again and again. Well, wait, when you say good luck, you absolutely can do a great job on southern rust by spraying fungicide. Repeatedly, so every other day for the no whole summer. No way, no way. Yes, that's the thing, Brian. Have it just residual, keeps coming. You're going to have residual for probably a couple of weeks if you're using a full rate of a good combination fungicide. So we start talking a lot more about these products like Triva Pro, for example, that's got three different modes of action, or at least using something like, let's say it's Preaxor or Stratego Yield, maybe Preemptor, two modes of action. You can do a fairly decent job on Southern Rust. So yes, you might not get 100% control, and I get that, Darren, but still, I want yield gain. I don't care about 100% control. I care about, hey, do I, if I invest $15 or $10, whatever I'm gonna spend, am I going to double my money or more? I think I absolutely will if I've got a Southern Rust issue. All right, here's the other thing is timing of that spray, because if you say, well, I might get 14 days of residual out of that product, you might, and you also might get 10. And if you wait 17 days before you're back out there, now you've had a whole nother week that rust has gotten a start on your plant, and, and it's just too late. You've gotta be preemptive on these treatments. Okay, with all fungicides, they are better at preventing disease than they are at curing disease, and that's where the big problem comes in. So what you can do with rust, the good news with rust, since it blows up from the south a lot of times, is you can look one state south of you if you're having an issue, or if they're having an issue there, you can start making these treatments early on. That absolutely can help you. The other rust that we're seeing more and more through all the wheat growing areas of our country is stripe rust. This is a real aggressive rust species that impacts wheat and some other crops as well, and some other annual grasses that may be growing. So if you say, well, I'll just rotate away from wheat for a while, guess what? Stripe rust can make a home in other grasses as well. It hasn't been one to overwinter in the harshest of environments. However, in mild climates, maybe in Colorado, uh, as you get into the Pacific Northwest, we have seen stripe rust overwinter in those climates. So it's one that you definitely need to be concerned of later in the season, especially around flag leaf as you get into the north, but even early in the season in winter wheat and in spring wheat. Just like I mentioned in corn, you can go with a three mode of action product. Nexacore came out a year ago from BSF. That's a pretty good one. Otherwise, there are plenty of two mode of action fungicides that can work well for you. If you get into heading timing and you want to spray one last shot for stripe rust, you're probably going to need to stick with a straight triazole product just so you can prevent some of the Don issues that we've seen. 
Well, rust can impact many different crops, and there are quite a few different types of rust that are starting to expand their footprint in our country. You can choose different hybrids or varieties to try to get a little better tolerance, but one of the real keys here is getting your fungicides applied timely and putting them out there ahead of time, ahead of when that infection occurs. Well, if you want top yields, it is really important to control diseases like rust. It's also important to control our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to do it on your farm coming up later in the show. Our Morton is so much more to us than just a building. It's a place where we spend time with friends. It's a place where we hold family gatherings. It's become very important to us. Morton Buildings. For work. For life. For generations. Contact us now during our annual sales event to save on your next building. Unlock the nutrients in your soil with Tag Team LCOXC Liquid Soybean, a triple action biological product that helps improve nutrient access. Together with the LCO molecule, a rhizobia delivers nitrogen fixing benefits, while an additional microbe makes phosphate in the soil more available. Three powerful technologies in one extra concentrated formulation. See how it can help your yield potential at MonsantoBioAg.com unlock. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We count it. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on, Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. We raise corn, beans, and then uh, about 7,500 head of hogs a year. About uh, 800 acres of beans this year. All 800 are Liberty Link this year. Our biggest weed pressure is definitely the water hemp. That's why we switched to Liberty Link. We were Roundup ready and uh, we had some resistance. I got sprayed three times one year that didn't even come close to killing them. So the next year we switched to Liberty Link thinking we'd switch back and forth every year and Liberty Link performed so well we never switched back. We have a test plot that had Roundup and Liberty Link right next to each other and the Liberty Link out yielded it the past five years. It's very important to have good weed control. For one, it just looks better to look at a nice clean field, but yield wise, it's also very important. The Liberty Link system has a two plus bushel per acre yield advantage over ASGRO Roundup ready to extend soybeans. More at libertylinkadvantage.bear.us. Always read and follow label instructions. My least favorite bug is the grub, and there are several different grubs out there. When they become adults, they may be a June beetle, they may be something else, and they also may be a Japanese beetle. That's what we're going to talk about today. All right, with these Japanese beetles, I'm going to summarize this for you really quickly. Scout and spray when you have an economic threshold. That's really it. That's our entire segment. Boy, that was simple, Darren. Well, it seems simple, but here's the thing, Brian. They're great big bugs, and they've got a hard shell to them. So it's not like you're going to go out there with the lowest rate of just any insecticide and get them under control. Okay, so what you do want to do is use the highest labeled rate of maybe a pyrethroid. Also, Lorsban could be pretty effective on Japanese beetles, too. Just make sure that you're out there before this gets to be a super widespread problem. When I talk about economic threshold, for Japanese beetles, you've got to look at the value of your crop and the cost to spray. Since insecticides are at an all-time low price, it's a lot more economical than it used to be. Also, since we have much higher yield levels and still fairly decent price levels, I'm not saying great, but you know, it's not a dollar and 30 cents on corn or anything like that. Since we have fairly decent price levels, you know what, that crop is probably worth quite a few dollars out there with your high yields. So I'm just trying to say it doesn't take very many Japanese beetles to justify treatment. One last comment I will make is insect resistance is real to insecticides. We don't want to see us lose a class of chemistry because we just sprayed it over and over and over again. Use either a dual mode uh, product where you've got two different chemistries in it or at the bare minimum, rotate when you're spraying a pyrethroid once, use an organophosphate or something else the next time. All right, we've got our favorite part of the show, our Weed of the Week time. It's coming up next.
The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Dow AgroSciences. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> is just an annual weed, so you think, oh, no big deal. But boy, this one is common ragweed. We see it continuing to spread across much of the Midwest. Okay, a couple of problems here. One, it can cause some allergy problems for some people, and two, it's becoming resistant to Roundup. Yeah, and that Roundup resistance is a real challenge, but the good news here is you can go Liberty, you can go Extend, maybe Enlist if that's labeled at some point. Also, use pre-emerge herbicides. Use the three pre's in soybeans. That's really going to help a lot. Well, here's what we've seen, Brian, is that we relied on Roundup, Roundup, Roundup for many years. Now we got Roundup resistance. We see other guys that are doing first rate, first rate, first rate every time they've got a ragweed problem. And I'm really concerned about that. It's not working in some cases. Now we see on the corn side, HPPD is being used over and over and over again. One mode of action all by itself repeatedly we're just heading down the wrong road with some of these herbicide choices. Right, definitely. So when I think about corn, sure you can throw an HPPD in there, but have other modes of action too. Personally, I'd just as soon you go with something like Verdict to begin with, then follow post-emerge with status. If you want to throw an HPPD in somewhere, you certainly can, but again, multiple modes of action is the key. We don't see common ragweed being a huge issue in wheat, but when it is, we can start with Sharp and Pre, do a really nice job on ragweed control, reducing the population, not killing 100%. But then post-emerge, we've got some awesome options. I really like Husky. All right, well, that's it for our Weed of the Week Common Ragweed. Stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. Let's take a look at our picks for the championship season. We've got 10-34-0. No, no, no. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this agro liquid team. Take a look at this lineup. They got it all. The talent, their players can meet any challenge on any field. The coaching staff, the best I've seen. So that's your pick? No discussions? Nope. Agro liquid is the team. They're going all the way to the championship. <laughs> In life, when you put the max in, you get the max out. It's no different for your corn, which is why 40 years of effort have gone into proving that Instinct and Anserve nitrogen stabilizers do more than just stabilize nitrogen, they maximize nitrogen. So your corn gives you the max in return. Our Morton is so much more to us than just a building. It's a place where we spend time with friends. It's a place where we hold family gatherings. It's become very important to us. Morton Buildings, for work, for life, for generations. Contact us now during our annual sales event to save on your next building. Smart Farming is playing hockey with my son. Alright, sweetie, are you excited to go? Yeah. <laughs> Smart Farming? is going on more family vacations. Smart Farming is getting some much needed rest. Smart Farming is spending more time doing what you love. Make it happen with Farm Command.
Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Commodity Classic is an early adopter's paradise. This is where what's next happens, where you can meet the people who are changing the way you farm. From the jaw-dropping trade show to outstanding educational sessions to one-on-one -on -one conversations with other farmers from across the nation, you'll be among the first to experience the new ideas, innovations, and technology that can help your operation grow beyond. Spend some farmer time in Anaheim, Tuesday, February 27th through Thursday, March 1st. Discover more at commodityclassic.com. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We counted. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on. Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. What difference could daily satellite imagery make on your farm? Here's a look at how it can make you money in today's Iron Talk. With the availability of near daily satellite imagery of all my fields through services like Farmer's Edge, I can finally get data in time to help this year's crop. Here's how I plan to use it to add profit to our farm this year. The big advantage of satellite imagery is it allows you to make proactive decisions. With Farmer's Edge, for example, you can get maps within days of image capture with predictive agricultural-based analytics. The picture is nice, but having a good idea of what it means in terms of my crop is worth a ton. In my mind, the biggest financial advantage you'll see is the ability to prioritize scouting and to act much quicker than you otherwise would be able to. Seeing where the hot spots are and being able to go out to just the top few spots on your farm allows you to manage your time and focus on $100 an hour jobs more. Some of the things you'll be able to better target are insect and weed issues. These can be treated earlier before they make much impact on your yield. The other thing you can diagnose quicker is nutrient deficiencies, and I'd argue this may be an even bigger financial win for your farm. Think about it. If you're short of, say, zinc in an area of the field that your grid or zone soil testing program has missed, it will show up in your crop not only this year, but every year that you farm. Finding those spots by noticing small differences in plant growth through daily satellite imagery is the easiest and cheapest way to detect them. Solving those problems will pay you a nice return for the rest of your farming career. The last couple things I'd mention are quite helpful as well. You can see the natural progression of crop health each day through the growing season, which is nice on a number of fronts. Finally, you'll be able to better predict yields and harvest date for each field. Daily satellite imagery is really cool, but it can also make you money and save you time this year. Check it out for your farm. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Well, that's our time for today, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD Radio Show, where we take your live phone calls each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Sirius XM Channel 147. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Planting a crop not intended for harvest is becoming a regular thing. It's called a cover crop. The use of cover crops is on the rise due to the many benefits they provide the soil, including reducing erosion, improving nutrient availability, and breaking up soil compaction. To learn about cover crops and more, visit rnmf.org.